Now that the Democratic Party controls the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives, America's in for major changes in climate and energy policy. What has President Biden done already? What's still in store? What are the hurdles he and his colleagues in the Senate and House face? Find out and join the discussion by posting your comments and questions to our guests, Dr. J. H. Lair and Tom Harris with the International Climate Science Coalition on Cornwall Alliance's From the Stacks Facebook and YouTube, uh, YouTube live stream coming up next. Major changes are in store for Americans and for people all over the world because of the change in leadership in the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives here in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> we are in for uh, changes uh, in terms of climate policy, energy policy, and more. Uh, what are the hurdles that President Biden and his colleagues in the Senate and the House of Representatives face? Uh, what's, what's President Biden done already? What's in store for us still? Uh, I'm Cal Beisner, the founder and national spokesman of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. Glad to welcome you to tonight's program with guests Dr. J.H. Lair and Tom Harris with the International Climate Science Coalition. Uh, before we get started on that, I want to let you know about a uh, wonderful, wonderful new book uh, that we are offering for free from the Cornwall Alliance, Hot Talk Cold Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate. This is by the legendary atmospheric physicist and uh, all around great scientist, Dr. S. Fred Singer, uh, with some assistance in putting together the third edition, which is this edition, from Dr. David Legates and Dr. Anthony Lupo. Uh, both of those are scholars associated with, this, with the Cornwall Alliance. Uh, for in, as our way of saying thank you when you make a donation of literally any size, we will be glad to send you a free copy of Hot Talk Cold Science, one of the best books ever written on this subject. All you need to do to ask for your copy is go to cornwallalliance.org, click on the donate button, and as you fill out the donation form, when you come to the comments field, Simply write in Hot Talk Cold Science or promo code 21-02 or both, and we'll be glad to send it to you. Well, again, we are delighted this evening to have as our special guests, Dr. J. H. Lair and Tom Harris, who wrote a couple of articles recently, America Today and The Light at the End of the Tunnel, and The American People Will Cancel the Democrats in 2022, shortly before President Biden took office. Uh, Dr. Lair is an internationally renowned scientist, author, and speaker who's testified before Congress on environmental issues dozens of times and consulted with nearly every agency of America's federal government, as well as many foreign countries. His PhD is in groundwater hydrology, and he's a senior policy analyst with the International Climate Science Coalition and an advisor with the Heartland Institute. Jay, I understand you were among early leaders in the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. Tell us a little yeah, about the about... EPA as its founders envisioned it and what it's become since then. Well, there were about a half a dozen of us that worked from 1968 to 1971 to form the Environmental Protection Agency and uh, develop a safety net of regulations to protect our water, our air, our agriculture, our waste disposal, our mining, and uh, and so on. And we did a fabulous job doing exactly that in the 70s. And uh, starting about 1980, uh, environmental radical zealots uh, literally infiltrated EPA and took it over. And there has not been a useful piece of environmental legislation passed by the US EPA since 1980. That's a, a dramatic statement to make. But it's absolutely true. Every, everything we did in the 70s 
was all that was needed uh, to be done. And now the EPA is just an arm of the uh, socialist Democrat leftist uh, groups throughout the world. Hmm. Thank you, Jay. Our second guest, Tom Harris, is executive director of the Ottawa, Canada-based International Climate Science Coalition. Tom has 40 years of experience as a mechanical engineer and project manager, science and technology communications professional, and technical trainer and science and technology advisor to a former opposition senior environment critic in Canada's parliament. Tom, Tell us about the International Climate Science Coalition. When did it begin? What's its mission? How does it pursue that? And, and where can people go to learn more? Yeah, sure. The International Climate Science Coalition was started by Terry Dunleavy and Brian Leyland out of New Zealand. They needed an international body to represent the New Zealand Climate Science Coalition at the Bali Conference. Uh, they brought me on in 2008. I was actually at the New York event for Heartland, their International Climate Change Conference number one, and Terry invited me to be the executive director, and I've been with them ever since. It's interesting, though, that I used to be on the other side of the climate debate. I was not really a fanatic at all, but I did reference it once in a while because I was an aerospace engineer, and I talked about how studying other planets actually helps us understand the Earth. And uh, Professor Tim Patterson from Carleton took one of my newspaper articles and he used it in his class, except told them that the part about Venus, the runaway greenhouse effect on Venus, could not happen on the Earth. So it was not actually a good comparative planetology example. And so I visited with Patterson and he exposed me to the whole branch of uh, climo, what do they call it, cosmoclimatology and geological climatology and showed me that there's no correlation. So it brought me over to that side of the debate. I started writing with him uh, part time until eventually it led to me being with the International Climate Science Coalition. People can learn about us at climatescienceinternational.org. Thank you, Tom. That's climatescienceinternational.org. I highly recommend that you all go there and learn more from their really excellent website. They have tremendous information there. Well, in your articles, which the two of you wrote shortly before President Biden's inauguration, you expressed optimism that the changes that would come with his administration and democratic control of both houses of Congress might be short-lived. <laughs> in fact, that their control of the White House, the Senate, and the House might also be short-lived. Now, Lots of Americans who voted for former President Donald Trump just don't share that optimism. So why do you think as you do? Jay, you first. Well, I really think uh, they're gaining the House, the Senate, and the White House. It's the best thing that has ever happened uh, to the United States in many, many decades. And the reason is we have been trending toward socialism, uh, environmental zealotry, leftist uh, attitudes for many, many decades. And I think to wake up the American people, uh, it was best to give them the reins to run the country. And of course, they will do their best to run it into the ground. But fortunately, two years is not enough to do really significant damage to our economy, to our oil reserves, to our policies on climate change and uh, electric cars and bringing wind and solar on. They really are not going to have enough time to do this, but what they will have enough time to recognize that every citizen in this country, with the exception of maybe 15 percent that are that are true leftist, socialist, communist types, everybody else is going to be hurt by this administration. They're so much over the edge, the average person really within the next 12 months, but certainly within the next 24 months, are going to wake up in the next election cycle and overturn their majority in the House of Representatives, win back a majority in the Senate, and uh, then uh, the Biden administration is not going to be able to enact anything for the next two years. The Republicans will then come up with a, a very good candidate for the 2024 election, and we will win in a landslide. Uh, I admit to being a, a certified optimist. As you know, I've uh, made 1,481 skydives in the last 42 years. So uh, I am an optimist, all safely. 
I am absolutely positive that this is going to work out well for America. We'll, we'll suffer a little for the next two years, and then the Democratic Socialist Party will truly be canceled. <laughs> well, I wish I... I wish I felt the same kind of optimism that you do, Jay. I'm not quite there, but uh, it's nice to hear it. Tom, do you have something to add to what uh, Jay just said? Yes, I do. And in fact, I've been reading a, a paper called The Art of Always Being Right, 38 Ways to Win When You Are Defeated. Now, that's written by a 19th century German philosopher called Arthur Schopenhauer. And it's quite interesting because he purposely... Um, gets you to trick your opponent into exaggerating and then you can attack his exaggerations because they're so easy and so ridiculous but you know joe biden has done us a favor if you look at his executive order and joe and i or jay and i are actually dissecting the executive order right now on the america out loud website if people go there they should see it if it's not up now it'll be up any minute now because i was just talking to the editor but it's we've written three parts actually in which we dissect the executive order uh, because the executive order is so ridiculous uh, that it's actually very, very easy to make fun of. And in fact, we're saying that you should mock the executive order because it's so absurd. I mean, completely absurd. And you, you know you're in the right piece when you see a guy with hair on fire. Okay, that's the, the piece that's associated with our article. So I think he's done us a favor. We didn't have to trick him into it. He's done it himself because the exclamations that he makes are just so stupid. Okay, well, in the first of, of the uh, two articles that I referred to earlier, uh, the two of you listed 11 major changes that have transpired in America in the last two decades as kind of a background for what's going on at this point. Uh, allow me to list those for our viewers. I think you had a, a really insightful list here. So here they are. Number one, somehow it's become un-American for the census to count how many legal U.S. citizens are in the United States. Number two, people who say there is no such thing as gender are demanding a female president. Number three, universities that advocate equality discriminate against Asian Americans in favor of African Americans. Number four, some people are held responsible for things that happened before they were born and other people are not held responsible for what they're doing right now. Uh, number five, criminals are caught and released, but more, hurt more people. Uh, but stopping them is bad because it's a violation of, well, their rights. Number six, people who've never owned slaves should pay slavery reparations to people who have never been slaves. Number seven, if a man says he's a woman, you're required to agree with him or is it her, regardless of his or her anatomy? Uh, number eight, Irish doctors and German engineers who want to immigrate to the U.S. must go through a rigorous vetting process. But any illiterate and uh, with, with uh, questionable history who jumps the southern border appears to be welcome. Number nine, five billion dollars for border security was said to be too expensive yet we spend a bigger fortune for free health care for illegals. Think about this. If you cheat to get into college, you go to prison. But if you cheat to get into the country, you may get to go to college for free. Number 10, people have died of a Chinese virus, but it is considered racist to refer to it as such, even though it began there and spread across the world because the Communist Party of China allowed its infected citizens to fly all over the world even while quarantining Chinese cities to prevent its spread in their own country. Regardless, it's no more racist to call it the Chinese virus than using German measles or Spanish flu. German, Spanish, and Chinese, and Mexican for that matter, are nationalities, not races. And finally, number 11, the death penalty for murder is considered wrong, but the unborn may be terminated without a second thought. Now, after that list, you wrote the most effective, if painful, way to stop the trend is to engage in a full trial of ideas that many thought would lead this country to less opportunity for all. Jay, what do you mean by that? Uh, how do you expect that well, trial you, to You basically are supporting my optimism entirely. You list uh, 11 points that are irrational and unreasonable 
and they're all going to come out front and center uh, in the news media, uh, whatever you read, whatever you get on uh, your social media, you're going to see these 11 things you just described played out in, in real time. And uh, if there's a modicum of common sense among a, a huge percentage of people who voted for Mr. Biden primarily because they didn't like Donald Trump, they're going to uh, trend back to the right side of the aisle and will not be voting for a Democrat in the next uh, election at the House of Representatives, the Senate, uh, and, and the president. So that's the ammunition that supports my tremendous optimism. And Cal, I become more optimist every day as people read my articles and write me and say, you know, uh, you've really made me feel better. It makes sense, and uh, I think I'm going to stop uh, with my head down, raise my head up, and uh, live through whatever punishment we will get for the next two years. And it will be far less than what the Biden administration think uh, they can create in, in that period. Okay. Now, you correctly predicted that President Biden would take America back into the Paris Climate Accord. But you expressed hopes in your articles that he would not stop construction of the key, new Keystone XL oil pipeline, uh, which brings oil from Canada to the United States, hopes that he dashed. So let's start with Paris and get to Keystone in a minute. What's wrong, Tom, with rejoining the Paris Agreement? Well, if you believe that we're causing dangerous climate change, which of course I don't believe, but if you did, uh, the Paris Agreement is a terrible agreement because the major emitter is China, which of course emits twice as much as the United States. But ever since 1992, China has been designated a developing nation. So not only do they not have to um, stabilize their emission limits until 30, uh, uh, 2030, but they really don't have to ever reduce their emissions because the uh, Paris Agreement is based on something called the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was signed by President Bush in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. And it says that developing countries as their first and overriding priority is poverty alleviation and development, which of course makes sense. But what that means, because that's a priority above climate change. So what that means is they will actually continue to expand their use of coal. And when people say, whoa, your emissions are going way up, they'll say, yes, but we have an out clause. We don't actually have to worry about it if it violates our um, primary objective, which is to alleviate poverty and to, um, you know, basically promote development. Now, they actually cornered the Chinese representative at the Paris, sorry, the Peru agreement back in um, 2014. And they asked him, would we actually consider changing the framework convention on climate change, which is the foundation, as I say, to the Paris agreement? And he said, our intention is to enforce the agreement, not to change it. So yes, they've got a sweetheart deal. China can continue to emit as much as they want forever, not to 2030, but forever. And they're the, by far the biggest emitters. So what the heck? I mean, the United States should not be in such a stupid agreement. Yeah, and it's also the case that we could in fact eliminate the entire US economy, take all of our emissions out and it would not make any significant difference in global average temperature at the end of the century. Uh, I, I often tell people, really, there are just two numbers that you need to know about the Paris Climate Agreement. The first is how much it will cost to implement every year. And that is, well, anywhere from one to two trillion dollars a year from 2030 onward. Uh, forget about the few trillion dollars before 2030, you know, chump change, right? Uh, but one to two trillion dollars a year from 2030 all the way end uh, through to the end of the century. And so that's the first number. The second number is that the amount of warming that would be prevented by the full implementation of the Paris Agreement by every single country that has signed on to it would be, well, three tenths of a degree Fahrenheit of global warming in the year 2100. And that works out to a price of 23.3 to 46.6 trillion dollars per tenth of a degree Fahrenheit of temperature reduction, which is right near the margin of error in measurement and has absolutely no impact on ecosystems or human well-being. Well, Jay, 
how about you? Do you have something to add as to your assessment of the uh, Paris Agreement? I, I do. Uh, Tom and I are working on an article where we're breaking down the Paris Agreement and explaining to the public, there are readers, uh, what is really contained in it. And uh, not one in 10 people really understand uh, what's in there. There are a couple interesting things that uh, any new technology the United States might develop to reduce carbon dioxide emissions must be given free of charge to every other country in the world. And it says that any uh, country can sue the United States if they can show that our carbon dioxide emissions are floating over their country. There are seven or eight issues like that <laughs> that are absolutely absurd. And we're going to, we're writing an article explaining what the accord is. But I'd also add one thing, the number you quoted of the, the tenth of a degree Fahrenheit at the end of this uh, century, even that is wrong. Uh, you really cannot calculate a number. The only number that matters with regard to man's impact on the temperature of this planet is zero. It's zero. Unfortunately, we have so many well-meaning good scientists that agree with us that it's inconsequential man's impact on climate, but they still spend their professional lives trying to figure out uh, what whole number fits three or four zeros to the right of the decimal point, yeah. which were a, a number yeah. like you quoted. It's absolutely absurd. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, can, I should I'd like to add, add, I could add something to that just quickly, me, and that is that global temperature give moment, doesn't Tom. matter. Give me, give me just yeah. a moment, Tom. Give me just a yeah, moment. Sure. As well. <laughs> I should have mentioned uh, that those two figures are the figures that come if you assume all of the claims about the warming effect of CO2 pushed by the people who put the Paris Agreement together. And if you assume their own claims about what it would cost to implement it. So, you know, I happen to agree with you, Jay, that the actual warming effect from added CO2 in the atmosphere is uh, probably real, but almost certainly so slight as not to be measurable and certainly not to have any kind of impact on ecosystems or on human well-being. Okay, now, Tom, you, uh, you wanted to add yeah. something there as well. Well, one thing that I always bring up at conferences and the, and the environmentalists go berserk when I do this, I, I just tell them, look, global temperature doesn't matter. And I give you an example. Let's say half of the earth became 10 degrees warmer and half became 10 degrees colder. That would be a catastrophe. The, the pressure differential would cause a, incredible extreme weather. And yet the average temperature would be the same. There would be no change. So in fact, average temperature is immaterial. I mean, there's no species, no super being that straddles the planet experiencing average temperature. We all live in regions. What matters is what's it doing right where you live? <laughs> so average yeah. temperature, besides the fact that some people like Chris Essex say you can't even calculate it because it doesn't even mean anything uh, like density or viscosity. But, but the point is average temperature of the earth is completely immaterial. It doesn't even matter. Yeah, very good. I, I appreciate that. I'm totally with you there. Uh, folks, what we've been talking about here is just a little bit about the science of uh, what emissions of carbon dioxide and other so-called greenhouse gases can do in the way of affecting global average temperature. If you'd like to learn a whole lot more about that from one of the very best books ever published on the subject, now in its third edition, just released last month in its third edition, uh, you want to read Fred Singer's Hot Talk, Cold Science, Global Warming's Unfinished Debate. Uh, this third edition was uh, put together by Dr. Singer before his death last spring with some assist assistance from Dr. David R. Legates, a climatologist at the University of Delaware, and Dr. Anthony Lupo, who is a climate scientist at the University of Missouri, both of them also are uh, scientists in the network of scientists uh, of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. So from now to the end of February, as long as our supply lasts, we would love to send you a free copy of this uh, roughly 300 page hardback book, a uh, tremendous, tremendous source, a uh, free copy as our way of saying thanks when you make a donation of literally any size. To request it, just go to cornwallalliance.org, click on the donate button, 
as you finish filling out the donation form, when you come to the comments field, put in there hot talk cold science or promo code 21-02, and we will gladly send you a free copy. Well, uh, Jay and Tom, what can Americans expect in the way of gasoline and electricity prices because of Biden's new policies? Either one of you can go first. Well, there, we're going to see probably in the next year at least a 50 cent uh, increase in, uh, in gasoline. And as uh, electric utilities add uh, wind and solar, which is mandated by 26 states and the uh, Washington, D.C., uh, people should see their electric rates go up by at least uh, a third and, uh, and maybe more because you're adding expenses that uh, make no contribution uh, to their uh, electric utility because all wind and solar has to be backed up with uh, natural gas uh, plants uh, running at full uh, that have to be come on as soon as uh, the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. So all additional wind and solar uh, that's put into play in any utility in the United States is a total waste of money. And all it will do is increase the electric rates to uh, every consumer. So these are the small things that everybody uh, will see by the end of the first year uh, that's going to make them uh, unhappy and uh, move to move them toward voting uh, differently in the next election cycle two years hence. I can just add a little to that. Yeah, in fact, it's interesting. If you look at Ontario, it gives you a preview of what you're likely to experience if these policies of Biden continue for very long. In 2002, previous Premier Dalton McGuinty said that we were going to get rid of coal and bring in lots and lots of wind turbines. And so we did. And now we went from 25% of our electricity generated by coal in 2002 to zero today. And what we've seen over the, over the years has been a 200% increase in electricity costs. Now it has come down a little bit at times because the government tends to regulate it, but that's the impact of getting rid of your least expensive energy source is a 200% rise eventually in electricity costs. Yeah, and a rough doubling of the electricity costs in Germany as it pursued similar policies. Well, neither of you really expected Biden to cancel further construction on the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, before we get into discussing that decision, Tom, would you just explain what the Keystone XL pipeline is and how it affects particularly American-Canadian relations? Yeah, for sure. In the north central part of Alberta is something called the oil sands. This is very thick uh, material in the ground where they can actually take the oil out of the sands. We actually clean the sands. It's, it's a little bit ironic that they say that it's a dirty process, but in fact, we put back sand without the oil in it. And we don't have the refining capability in Canada to handle it, so we have to ship it to the United States. So they already have Keystone Phase 1, 2, and 3 in operation. Keystone XL Phase 4 would actually be building a pipeline on a shorter route with a large diameter, bigger than parts of the Keystone pipeline that currently exists. It would be 36 inches, and it would be pumping 830,000 gallons per day to uh, a storage location in, uh, I believe it's in, in Oklahoma, that's right. Uh, they yes. would then process it and they actually mix it with a bit of American oil that's put in as it crosses some of the states into the U.S. Uh, the big issue here has been that the environmentalists regard the oil sands as a symbol of the evilness <laughs> against their fight for climate change uh, prevention. So indeed, it's become a symbol. The oil sands and anything to do with getting oil out of the oil sands, which includes, of course, Keystone XL, it's been a symbol. And so the environmentalists just focused very hard on Keystone XL. They swayed Joe Biden and the Democratic Party to be against it, even though in the short term, it would actually reduce emissions because you don't need the trucks to uh, bring the oil into the United States. But Keystone XL, um, the reason I think that they lost the argument was because they didn't address the climate issue. Okay, and they didn't address the fact that you can't replace it with wind and solar power. Instead, they focus on the job loss, which is very real, and the cost, 
but they didn't fight against Biden's primary arguments because he said point blank it was a climate decision, and yet their opponents uh, were afraid to bring it up. Okay, so Jay, what what will be the result of Biden's canceling further development of the Keystone Pipeline? Well, uh, I, I'm delighted to see that there are 18,000 union workers that lost their jobs, none of whom will be voting uh, for a, a Democrat in the next uh, election cycle. And it's that kind of thing we're going to see across the nation. Uh, virtually every executive order that he uh, has signed in the last uh, week or two, over 40, I believe, uh, are going to cost jobs somewhere. He calls them job making bills by having more renewable energy, more wind and solar. He's creating jobs. Well, we know historically it works in the opposite. Obama supported all kinds of renewable energy and they all ended up in bankruptcy court. Uh, so we're going to see more and more jobs lost by people who probably thought voting Democrat was a, uh, a good thing. So every time one of these things occurs, uh, I'm that much more optimistic that this two year trial of a socialist uh, administration that cares not at all for the people, only for their philosophy of government uh, is going to cancel their party in a short period of time. Yeah. Uh, another point to, to make about this is, is that uh, the canceling of this part of the Keystone Pipeline is likely to actually increase the amount to which we need to import oil from other sources, including some in the Middle East, which is exactly what we don't want to be doing, where we don't want to be dependent. And it's going to hurt our relations with Canada. And it will actually have nothing to do with keeping any of this oil from being uh, burned and turned into energy. Uh, the oil instead is most likely going to wind up being transported to China, which will then use it uh, for its own purposes. So this benefits the Chinese while not doing anything good for Americans. Um, <clears throat> I, I uh, think that we have a clip of uh, an interesting video uh, from Canada. Uh, do we have that ready to show? We cannot imagine a circumstance where the United States would effectively choose to benefit OPEC dictatorships that have spread, uh, uh, that have spread conflict and undermine global security rather than partnering with its close democratic ally, Canada. Now, the government of Canada has said that the, um, the top priority in the bilateral relationship is uh, Keystone XL. And I understand that Prime Minister Trudeau expressed that to President-elect Biden on their call on November 9th of last year, uh, in which uh, a, the statement was issued indicating that they had agreed to engage on issues such as uh, energy environment, including uh, Keystone XL. Uh, it is our uh, fervent hope that the incoming U.S. administration will keep that commitment to engage with the top ally of the United States, with Canada. Well, that was the Alberta Premier Jason Kenney speaking before Biden signed the executive order canceling Keystone. Uh, um, so Biden's gone ahead and canceled it after all. What do you think will be the reaction of the unions whose members were working on it and suddenly got laid off? Well, we've already seen that reaction. They're, they're, they're furious. I mean, there's, uh, there's 18,000 votes he's not going to get, uh, get back. You know, every time he does th something, and I shouldn't say he, it's they. You know, I don't think he wrote a single uh, executive order. People are putting it in front of him and he's signing them. Uh, he's got a cabal behind him that does all his work, and they've decided to thumb their nose at the people, and uh, they're going to pay for it. There's no question in my mind. Okay. Yeah, and I can actually read to you a quote from the Maryland-based United Association of Union Plumbers and Pipefitters, and, and this is a strategic mistake that they're making, and, and I'll explain why. They say new advancements in technology mean that these pipelines are low-carbon method of energy transportation and a critical part of de delivering affordable energy while achieving our shared climate goals. 
says Keystone XL would not only be constructed entirely by union labor, but it would be the first pipeline fully powered by renewable energy. Now, one of the problems with that, Cal, is that they're actually supporting the climate scare, and they're also supporting the idea that renewable energy is something that we should be really going hog wild into. And the trouble there is that the reasons that Biden and many of the others are opposing the Keystone XL is the climate scare. Okay, it's a natural outcome to want to get rid of all these mechanisms of transporting uh, hydrocarbon fuels if you think that we're causing dangerous climate change. So, you know, like Premier Kenny, quite frankly, and, you know, I appreciate what he was saying. The things he's saying are, in fact, quite accurate, but he supports the climate scare. In fact, his war room, they call it the um, Alberta Government War Room, Canadian Energy Centre, they promote the climate scare. And you think, my God, why would they promote something which the logical long-term outcome would be to get rid of the product that they want to sell? It doesn't make any sense. And, you know, if they're too afraid to actually contest the climate scare themselves, they should simply bring in scientists uh, from all points of view and have open public hearings, and then the public can hear what's really going on. But um, they're just too frightened to do this. And, you know, it's directly against any kind of logical debating tactic that you have to attack your opponent's primary argument, but they're afraid to do it. So they lose. And, you know, Keystone XL is just a symptom of the problem. We're going to see this in many uh, fossil fuel activities over the next four years with Biden, all driven by the climate scare and the ridiculous belief that you can replace fossil fuels with wind and solar power. So in, until they address those points, they're going to continue to lose, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, further in your article, you, you cited uh, Gregory Wrightstone, a geologist, author of the really excellent book, Inconvenient Facts, uh, that uh, you, you cited him saying that eliminating 100% of America's CO2 emissions would only reduce global temperature, if you believe the climate scare people, by about 0 0.04 degree Celsius by 2050. Uh, and of course, there's good reason to think that it wouldn't even achieve that. And then you wrote, even John Kerry admitted in 2016 that anything the U.S. does <clears throat> will essentially have no effect on climate because China, India, and Africa will offset whatever we do. Well, so we've talked a bit about those things there's another thing to be looking at uh, in terms of the recent change of administrations here in America. There's speculation that Biden's age, uh, sorry, Jay, <laughs> uh, and, and his health might preclude, and I'm sure your health is outstanding. Yeah, how many how many miles is it per month or whatever that you bicycle now, Jay? Well, I, I, my, my goal is to bike, to bike 4,000 miles a month. I mean, a year, 4,000 a year. So. A year. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I, well, I bike uh, indoors or out every day of the year. All right. So there's speculation, though, that, uh, that Biden's age and health might preclude his filling out his full term. Uh, and Vice President Kamala Harris then would replace him. What should we expect from that? I don't think it matters at all. Actually, I think his health is uh, better. Uh, it's his wife, uh, Jill, that wants the White House more than him, and uh, she'll prop him up. I, I do not believe they will move him out, and uh, I don't think it would matter whether it's him or Kamala uh, Harris. I mean, she's even more socialist, uh, communist than he, but she has no experience, wouldn't uh, have any leadership uh, skills. I don't think anything would be worse uh, if she took the helm or, or he continues, but actually I have confidence that he uh, will continue. He's only been a figurehead from day one, and I think he can serve that role, uh, whatever his health is. In my view, he's a young man. He looks he looks healthy. He actually looked healthier than than Trump in the last months of Trump's uh, presidency. So I don't worry about it either way. Okay, uh, you've also talked about the deep divisions in America right now. Uh, Jay, Tom, both of you, if you could be advisors to the Biden administration and to Democratic leaders in Congress, and if you could really be taken seriously, listened to carefully, uh, what would you tell them that they could do 
in climate change and energy policy that could help bring unity out of this division that's so terribly tearing this country apart? Well, I know Tom would express it differently, but I would uh, tell them that uh, we have problems around the world uh, with poverty, with water supply, with waste disposal, uh, with energy, and uh, climate is a boogeyman that does not exist. But they launched it 30 some odd years ago because they saw it as a way to world government. They saw it as a way to enrich the power of the UN. And if they can control carbon dioxide emissions, they control our every breath, the number of children we have. And the whole aim was world power, uh, nothing to do with improving the lives of our citizens. So th there's nothing they could do except admit it's a fraud. Okay. Yeah, I, I got an idea. We, we had a uh, contractor actually that did a study looking at what messaging would actually bring the left and right together. And it was interesting when they spoke about adaptation, in other words, getting ready for climate change, burying cables underground because of extreme weather, whether it's caused by nature or caused by us, it really makes no difference. The fact is, uh, across the world, we're spending over a billion US dollars a day on climate finance, and only 5% of it goes to adaptation. And everybody in the focus groups, left, right, and center, they all agreed that was a mistake that in fact we should help people adapt to climate change. In our case, we would say natural climate change, and that's where the money should be going. So what we'd like to see is the UN wanted a 50-50 split between adaptation and mitigation, trying to stop it. Um, but in fact, it's a 95 to five split where only 5% goes to adaptation. What I would say to the Biden administration is, look, you can get, um, you know, cross the board support for your policies if you focus on adaptation. In the United States, you can actually have storm shelters along the coast of Texas and Louisiana so that people don't have to drive like crazy in traffic jams to get away from hurricanes. They can just do what they do in India, which is go up a couple of stories into massive concrete storm shelters. And, uh, you know, so there, mm. that is a unifying thing. I think the adaptation message is what I would promote. Okay. Um, there's another message. Um, I'm not sure just how much unifying we could get from this, but that is the message about the actual benefits of both warming itself and the CO2 added to the atmosphere that is supposedly causing that warming. Uh, what are the actual benefits of those two things? Well, 24% of the uh, earth is greener than it was uh, 30 years ago. Uh, the better our crops grow, uh, we're growing things in deserts that we could never grow before. Uh, carbon dioxide is 100% good. Uh, there is nothing bad about carbon dioxide. We're at around 415 parts per million. Uh, I hope I live to see us reach uh, 500 or more. And the more CO2, the greener the earth, the easier vegetation grows, the better animals eat the better man uh, eats, it's all good. So the left has painted carbon dioxide as something bad when in fact it is all good. There is no question it is, the, it is due to carbon dioxide that 24% of the planet is greener than it was 30 years ago. That's only a good thing. Yeah, I mean, we're at one of the um, lowest levels of CO2 in Earth's history. You know, people don't realize that CO2 has been 1300% of today, not this measly 40% rise since 1880, 1300%. And the earth did fine. In fact, there was much more uh, lush vegetation and, uh, you know, crops grow actually billions of dollars. Look at CO2science.org with Craig Idso. He shows the impact of CO2. It's a beneficial thing. Yeah, Craig did, and he's a mutual friend to all three of us. Uh, Craig Idso of the Center for the Study of Carbon Dioxide and Global Change, or CO2Science.org, did a, a study a number of years ago where he, he, uh, he looked at the findings from literally thousands of, of different experiments, studies on the effect of adding CO2 to the atmosphere in which plants grow. And he concluded from all of those that uh, the CO2 that we had added to the atmosphere from 1960 to 2012 
had added all by itself. Nobody had to pay for this. Nobody, nobody spent any money for it. That CO2 all by itself had added roughly $2.3 trillion worth of crop uh, yields to the global uh, food supply. And then he projected where we would go over the next, uh, well, from 2012 to 2050, in terms of what we're projected to be, the CO2 increase by then. And he said that all by itself, again, without anybody having to pay any extra for this, that added CO2 would add roughly about another $9.6 trillion worth of crop yields to the global food supply. I think that's a good thing. You know, adding CO to the, uh, CO2 to the atmosphere makes pretty much all plants grow a whole lot better. It makes them uh, grow better in warmer and cooler temperatures and in wetter and drier soils. Uh, they resist diseases and pests better. They make better use of soil nutrients. They increase their fruit, uh, fruit to fiber ratio. It's really an all-win-win all situation. Uh, far better for anything that eats plants or anything that eats something that eats plants. So as far as I'm concerned, that's that's great. And particularly because I'm especially concerned about the plight of the poor around the world, who are the ones who are most harmed by food shortages, by high prices for food and so on. Uh, adding CO2 to the atmosphere is just a great way to uh, to feed the human human race. Well, thank you both uh, very much for joining us this evening. Uh, would love to hear some closing comments from each one of you. Yeah, I'll go first if, well, if that's yeah. okay with Jay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of people might say, oh, you folks are climate change deniers. There's no scientists that agree, uh, disagree, disagree with the climate alarm. Well, all they have to do is go to climatechangereconsidered.org. I'll say that again, climatechangereconsidered.org. And what you will see is citations of literally thousands of research papers from leading experts published in peer-reviewed journals that actually disagree with the climate scare. They either say it's completely wrong, the way Jay says, or they say it's hugely exaggerated. So that's what I encourage people to do. Look at CO, uh, climatechangereconsidered.org. Yeah. In my opinion, the worst ruling the Supreme Court of the United States ever made uh, was ruling that carbon dioxide was a pollutant. And they listened to nothing but lies from US EPA, uh, hours and hours of lying testimony and then an uneducated scientific group of nine uh, decided that uh, carbon dioxide was a pollutant gas, which is patently absurd. And that's what led to the problem. As long as the government can say carbon dioxide is a bad thing, that's what the Supreme Court said, uh, we have the right to control it uh, wherever it's admitted. Uh, the, I had hoped that the Trump administration would mount a campaign to undo that endangerment finding from the Supreme Court, but they decided not to take it on. And clearly this administration loves it. It's really the basis of all the heinous sure. things uh, they're gonna do in the, uh, in the coming two years. But again, uh, they're doing it out front. They're not hiding it, as Tom said. Uh, initially, they're exaggerating everything. We don't have to goad them into a exaggerating. We can make fools of most everything they do. And I think there's enough common sense left among the American public that in two years, uh, another at least 10 million people that voted for Biden will join the at least 76 million people that who did not vote for Biden a month or so ago. Yeah. The, uh, the Supreme Court case that Jay is talking about was Massachusetts versus EPA back in 2007. And just to illustrate the extent of the scientific illiteracy of the Supreme Court justices who, uh, who, who decided that case, uh, their definition of an air pollutant, uh, I don't have the exact wording here, but it was essentially this. It was any substance that is suspended in the air, atmospheric substance suspended in the air. I mean, literally, that could apply to bird feathers as they, uh, as they waft down from a bird flying overhead. 
Uh, it applies to oxygen. It applies to nitrogen. It applies everything. Uh, a water vapor, clouds. <laughs> these are these are all uh, things that are suspended in the atmosphere. And the definition of, of an atmospheric pollutant that the Supreme Court used was essentially anything suspended in the atmosphere. Uh, one has a hard time imagining that something quite that silly can have been said, but. Silly things do happen from time to time. Well, again, Tom, Jay, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been a, a lot of fun. Uh, I hope a very educational time for our viewers. Uh, you viewers, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, be sure to tune in next week when our guest will be Anthony Lupo, uh, one of the two scientists who helped uh, Dr. Fred Singer prepare the third edition of hot talk cold science and i'll remind you that for the month of february as our way of saying thanks when you make a donation of literally any size we will be delighted to send you a free copy of hot talk cold science just go to cornwallalliance.org click on the donate button uh, fill out the donation form and when you come to the comments for uh, comments field enter hot talk cold science or promo code 21-02 or both and we will be delighted to send the book to you totally free and your gift will be 100 percent tax deductible thanks again for joining us this evening we look forward to seeing you next week on from the stacks <laughs>